want to start by saying uh, just a little bit in terms of biography, uh, uh, recent biography, and, and in a sense say that to some degree I'm here because of the Internet, not so much the blogosphere, but the Internet. And I want to explain why. Uh, I, I sometimes argue that uh, our book, the book I wrote with John Mearsheimer, would not exist without the invention of the Internet for two different reasons. As some of you know, we had a lot of trouble getting our original article uh, published. Uh, after it was originally commissioned by the Atlantic and then the Atlantic got cold feet. Uh, we also tried to get it published as a little book. We talked to some literary agents and we talked to some publishers and nobody really was all that interested in the idea. Uh, and then we eventually, through a long and tortured process, got to the London Review of Books. Uh, it was published there. There was another uh, simultaneous footnoted version up on the Kennedy School's website. And three months later there had been 300,000 downloads of the original article. And all of a sudden, literary agents and publishers were calling us, right, because a market had been demonstrated, that there was, uh, there was real interest for the, a book on the topic, so we were able to then uh, get a, a book deal. Um, so it wouldn't exist without the Internet. Uh, second, we could not have done the research for the book without the ability to do online searches of all sorts of key sources. If you look at the book, it has multiple citations from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Haaretz, The Forward, uh, New York Jewish Week, etc. These are all available online. Many of them are searchable online. When I think back to my graduate student days, when you did research in newspapers on microfiche in the basement of the library, Right. The idea that we, could have, that we could have done this book with an army of research assistants and 10 years to do it. The point is the Internet has made an enormous amount of information on this and many other topics readily available, easily found, easily located. So it's no exaggeration to say the book would not exist uh, without the Internet. I wouldn't be standing here today if Al Gore had not gone to the trouble of inventing it. Um, now... Then the question is, why do I blog and why do I blog on this subject, among others? It's not the only topic I, I write about now. Um, well, over, I'd say, the past decade, like MJ, I was sort of increasingly impressed by the revolutionary features that the Internet was producing, uh, particularly for people in the information business. I, I first noticed that I was just spending a lot more of my time reading commentary and reading sources in the blogosphere rather than reading uh, newspapers and you know magazines of opinion they were just a lot more interesting and they were often by people who knew a hell of a lot more than an individual reporter who might have at least boned up a little bit first blog I ever read regularly uh, was Juan Cole's informed comment which emerged as this great one-stop shop if you cared about the war in Iraq and I'd gotten involved in that debate so I wanted to find out I started adding other blogs and I began to notice that the first 40 minutes of my work day was spent sort of going to the various sites that I had bookmarked and that's where I was starting to get a lot of information um, moreover I'm the parent of two teenagers and I was over time increasingly aware of their online habits uh, they don't get their news from the New York Times uh, or for the network news. They never watch ABC News. They couldn't tell you who any of those people are. They get it from Yahoo. Uh, they get it from watching The Daily Show. They do school research on Wikipedia, and their teachers teach them how to do online research intelligently right? and not be misled by you know, wacky uh, websites of one kind or another. Uh, this, by the way, is confirmed by, by data from survey data, the Pew Internet Survey Project. Uh, only 15% of uh, people over 73 report that they read blogs for news. 26% uh, of baby boomers, 34% of Gen Xers, that's people sort of 32 to 39. 49% of teenagers ages 12 to 17 say they read blogs for news and commentary. Uh, so I, the more I learned about this, the more I decided, along with MJ, this is the wave of the future, and I was going to try to catch it while I still could. Um, I blog because I think it's important for scholars to try and reach broader audiences, not to just write for three of their colleagues and their associated <laughs> graduate students. Um, and blogging is an incredibly effective way of doing that. I blog about uh, Israel-Palestine and Middle East questions because it's such a central topic for U.S. foreign policy, and I blog about a lot of these issues because I still find it an area uh, where uh, there are lots of taboos, lots of misinformation. I also increasingly, as I've gotten more into the issue, believe that there are just critical issues of ethics and justice involved here. Um, so I blog about that topic, uh, among others. 
Um, finally, I think it's clear, and this was where the first panel uh, talked a bit, that the rise of the blogosphere has made it much more difficult for governments to spin a story and to shape perceptions uncritically. Bloggers have become incredibly good as rapid reaction fact checkers. Right? When a speech comes out, when an article appears that is riddled with propaganda, there's literally a horde of bloggers that will immediately go after it, often people with very detailed knowledge. And so if it's an issue you care about, it's easy to start finding the critical commentary and finding it nearly in real time because there are so many voices who can weigh in on these things. And I think this is, this is terrific. Any major policy statement on this subject by U.S., Israeli, Palestinian officials immediately is under the microscope of all these various people. They're not all going to agree, but if you're paying attention and following the debate, it's easy to start figuring out what's right and what's not. Now, finally, the big question, uh, what impact has any of this had on policy, uh, and especially U.S. Middle East policy? Well, I think it's clear that the amount of attention that blogs get has gone up uh, dramatically just to take foreign policy where I blog. And my situation is rather different than Adam and Phil in that I was fortunate enough to be invited to join a sort of established platform. It's almost a mainstream media e-magazine in some ways. Uh, foreign policy last month got 10 million independent page views. Um, the highest month I've had since I started was 200,000 page views. Um, I think I averaged more in the realm of 75,000 uh, or so uh, independent views uh, per month. Um, a 2007 survey of Congress and congressional staff found that 11% of congresspersons read blogs regularly, but 94% of their communications staff read blogs, 50% of legislative assistants in 2007 reported that they read blogs regularly. Um, they said that they read blogs less than they read other news sources, but they also said, 50% said they thought blogs were, quote, more useful than mainstream media for identifying future national problems and debates. So you can see some signs of, you know, growing readership and even people in the policy world. And I'd say in the last two years I've gotten a dozen or so emails from people inside the government in responding to one thing or another that I've posted. Uh, saying, you know, that was really interesting, uh, nice work, or, or something like that. Uh, now, that said, I think it is almost impossible to find cases where a policy outcome on Israel-Palestine has changed as a result of the blogosphere. Other, some of you may have examples. I could not think of one. And I think the main reason, and MJ alluded to this, is that most of the mechanisms that drive American policy in the region haven't changed very much, the real causal mechanisms. I mean, first of all, Oil is still a major strategic interest of the United States, and some aspects of American Middle East policy are going to revolve around the fact that too many Americans like to drive SUVs, and we continue to be thirsty for that. But second, and I would argue it's actually more important, uh, the political clout of the Israel lobby on Capitol Hill hasn't changed, uh, which is why most congressmen will still roll over when AIPAC comes to call. Uh, again, MJ referred to that. Third, most foreign policy professionals uh, here in Washington and would-be foreign policy professionals are going to stick very close to the conventional wisdom on this topic because departing from it and doing so publicly could, of course, damage their careers. Uh, as the case of Chaz Freeman makes clear, uncritical support for the special relationship or steadfast silence on the issue are still the litmus tests if you want to have a serious foreign policy job in the executive branch. And again, the reason I think there is simple, the basic machinery, especially the role in shaping campaign contributions, hasn't changed uh, very much despite books that have been written or blogs that have been posted. The discourse has changed, I think, uh, pretty dramatically, but not the individual incentives that congressmen uh, are, and even executive branch politicians feel on a daily basis. And I think the most obvious illustration of that is the retreat that President Obama made after the Cairo speech, his initial insistence that all settlement building must stop. If you don't believe me, you should go Google Martin Indyk's interview with Haaretz back in July, where he attributes the shift, he, not me, attributes the shift in U.S. policy after the Cairo speech to anger at Obama over the position he was taking, and he in particular links it 
to campaign contributions. You can read uh, what he had to say about that. Now, th all that said, I think the Internet in general and bloggers in particular are going to matter more in the future. And I say this for several reasons. Um, first, I think the chances for a genuine uh, two-state solution are rapidly eroding. Some people think we're already past the point of no return. And I say that with regret because I personally think that's the best uh, outcome. But at some point, it will be clear to almost everyone that two states for two peoples isn't going to happen. Uh, and then the conflict will turn into a Palestinian struggle for civil and political rights within this larger, uh, call it greater Israel. That'll be carried out in full view of a watching world, carried live on YouTube, broadcast on Twitter. It'll be on platforms that haven't be, even been invented yet, disseminated virally, commented on prolifically. And the mainstream media will not be able to ignore that without looking completely foolish. So they will have to cover it too. And this is going to place, if it happens, and it's not certain that it will, George Mitchell may have a rabbit in his hat, after all. But if this does happen, it's going to place American politicians in a very awkward position. Do they support the principle of one person, one vote, independent of ethnicity or religion? That sounds an awful lot like the United States of America. It sounds very consistent with core American values. Or do they support the domination of one group by another as a matter of institutionalized practice? That doesn't sound very much like American values. In fact, it sounds a lot like apartheid. And apartheid has no legitimacy in the modern world. I think bloggers and the internet, if that scenario I've just sketched is what happens, uh, will play a key role in essentially broadcasting that struggle. And again, an American president who faces that choice which of these two things do you support is going to be in a very awkward position. Now, if you don't like that choice and you don't think an American president would want to be facing it at some point down the road, then one ought to be going all out uh, for a two-state solution before uh, it's really too late. Um, let me f I, I was going to stop there, but I was going to say just one more final thing about uh, the blogging aspect. And this is just more on the personal side. For those of you who are thinking about uh, starting a blog and are tempted to maybe write about the Middle East and about Israel-Palestine, two points. One, blogging is the antithesis of the other kinds of scholarly writing that I do. Uh, scholarly writing is all about striving for perfection. You do multiple drafts. You send things to your colleagues for comments. You don't put anything in print until you've really gone over it many times. I work very hard to try and make sure that what I write on my blog is correct and is accurate, but it's inevitably going to be more provisional, and sometimes you're going to get things, uh, get things wrong. Uh, of course, it will then live out there forever on the Internet, and people will jump all over you. Um, uh, and secondly, if you're going to do this, you need a different mental attitude. Uh, scholarly disputes, as a, speaking as an academic, can be pretty nasty, but it's nothing like the blogosphere. <laughs> and that's true, by the way, even if you don't write about Israel-Palestine topics. Of course, if you do that, you sort of take the normal snarkiness of the Internet and multiply it several times. The norms of discourse in the blogosphere tend to be very combative. So my basic advice is if you are hypersensitive to criticism, don't start a blog. Um, but if you're worried about criticism, you're probably not engaged by this particular issue anyway. Um, and that will bring me to my bottom line here. I don't think the blogosphere or bloggers have managed to alter U.S. Middle East policy yet. But if I can uh, paraphrase John Paul Jones, we have not yet begun to write. Thank you.